Jesus, we ask this morning that you would open our understanding of the truth of your word. Open our hearts to receive the truth of who you are. You've already given a word. We just need to trust, rely, and obey your word. You've already opened doors of opportunity. We just need to pray, God, give me the strength to work and to walk through the opportunity you've opened in front of me. And God, give me the wisdom to recognize when you've closed the door and not try to push open something you're not working in. Today, God, give us divine understanding of who you are and show us how your eternal word is eternally applicable in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. You can be seated. Let's give Jesus a hand praise this morning. <laughs> praise God, praise God. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation. We're going to be spending the bulk of today in just a few verses. Actually, just like two verses in Revelation chapter 3. But while you're turning there, I want to say buena asafiwe to all of our family in Kenya. We love y'all, Pastor John and Pastor Mary. We love y'all, all nine locations. God is doing amazing things. Next Sunday in Yondatawa County, we are baptizing somewhere around 40 people into the family of God. Come on, let's make some noise. Praise God. And then I also want to give a NOLA Church welcome to King Jeffrey in the nation of Uganda. I, he's already sent me a video of him preaching this morning, and God is moving up in the house in Uganda. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And also I want to give a, a word uh, to y'all from Pastor Luke. A lot of y'all have been praying for him, for him. He's been traveling in the Middle East, and he came home and got sick. He just wanted me to let everybody know he is doing much better. And he says, thank you for your prayers. And as, whenever he gets back from his next trip, which he's going to India and Sri Lanka, he's going to come be with us for a couple nights. And I can't wait for that. If you've never been here when Pastor Luke is here, you missing a treat. Amen. Yeah. We are in a series that we're just simply calling Revealed. And we are going verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the entire book of Revelation because this book is not a scary book. This is literally the unveiling of the one that we call God. And uh, just to kind of launch us off into this place, we're in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. This is what Jesus said to John, the revelator. He said, write the things which you have seen. And if you want to know what he's talking about specifically, he's talking about everything in chapter 1. God unveils himself in a way that John had never seen before. And so he, he's telling him, I want you to write what you've seen. I want you to write the things which are. This is encapsulated in everything that we see in chapters 2 and 3. We call this the church age. It's what we are a part of right now because we are the church. As long as the church is here in the earth, we are still in the church age. And then he says the things which will take place after this. After what? Well, after the church is gone. After God is finished with his work of the church in this season there are things that are going to take place after, and here in the next three or four weeks, we're going to be diving into that starting in Revelation chapter 5, and that's when things get really, really, really funky. And if you have not read through the book of Revelation, go ahead and pre-read a couple chapters. Don't get locked into anything, I promise you. You probably don't understand it, and that's okay. That's why we're doing this verse by verse, and we're going to get into some really cool things. Today, as I already mentioned, we are closing out the letter that Jesus wrote to the church in Philadelphia. And for those of you who don't know how this works, in chapters 2 and 3, Jesus dictates letters to seven different congregations to the apostle John, who is uh, exiled on the island of Patmos. He says, I want you to write this down, and then I want you to send these letters to the pastor of the church so that the pastor of the church can turn around and give the message to this congregation. These congregations represent in a symbolic sense the totality of what we call the church age. You say, well, what's the church age? The church age begins at the beginning of the book of Acts and it is continuing until the catching away of the bride of Christ. The catching away is a biblical term, a term that we're definitely more familiar with is the term rapture. Not a biblical word, but not a bad word. So the church age is from the beginning of the book of Acts until the catching away of the bride of Christ. And that is the church age. And all that simply means is that God is working through 
a group of people that he calls the church or the bride. The, the biblical word in, in the book of Matthew that is used here is the word ecclesia, which simply means a community of people dedicated to a common theme, a common purpose, and a common mission. And that theme, purpose, and mission is the theme, purpose, and mission of Jesus Christ, which is to seek and save the lost and advance the kingdom of God. Amen? So this is the community of Christ. This is the church of Jesus Christ, and he is referencing us as his bride. Okay, all the foundations out of the way. Y'all caught up with me? Cool. If you missed anything, which if this is your first time or if you had not been here a little bit, you have definitely missed some stuff. Look up NOLA Church on YouTube or go to nolachurch.com and you can find all of our sermons. Get caught up. We even have a podcast on Apple Podcasts and on Google Podcasts. And you can get caught up and just see all the stuff and hear all the things and just know what we're talking about. Amen? Y'all ready to get into today's sermon? The church in Philadelphia is a very unique church out of the seven. And we've discussed this. That out of the seven churches, six of them are getting rebuked. Six of them are getting kind of bumped by Jesus because six of them had some issues all up in their life. Somebody know about having issues in your life? Anybody got issues in your life? If you don't have issues, guess what? That's your issue. So you got issues in your life. These churches were struggling. At one point, these churches were very effective and possibly even large. We know for a fact that at least two of them were very large congregations. And I'm dropping that in in case someone thinks that God's against large churches. He's not. He works through large churches. He works through medium-sized churches. He works through small churches. He works through house churches. He works through small groups. He works through individuals who are on fire for him in a place where nobody else even recognizes him. God will use anyone who is available and breathing. That's the important thing. Check your neighbor. If they're not breathing, God's probably not going to be working in them very much longer. But you need to call for Amanda and she will be immediately begin to do CPR and we will be okay. So God is working through these churches. The church in Philadelphia is the one church out of the seven who is different because this is the only church that he doesn't just slap upside the head. Why? Because they were doing everything right. They were under severe persecution but in spite of the persecution, they were still reaching beyond themselves. In fact, this is why they're known, and people who study the Bible, they're known as the missionary church. It's because they were overflowing and trying to advance the kingdom of God in the middle of a very, very evil society. The, the society celebrated debauchery and all kinds of things and was built on the back of false religion. And I've said this every week, it sounds a lot like the New Orleans area. Like we're built on all kinds of jacked up religion and all kinds of jacked up. My wife already mentioned earlier today that we, we had all those people that got killed earlier this week. That's just more of the same in this city. And, and if you want to find a, a city out of these seven churches that really aligns with us, you actually can see where we are as a congregation in this city in each one of them. But there's a lot about what we see in Philadelphia that's common and what, what we've talked about is, and the reason I spent more time on this church than the others is because this is the church where Jesus unveils the promise of a catching away or a rapture. And I figured we needed a good lift in the middle of the book of Revelation to know that our hope is not in this world, amen? Somebody know that your hope is not to just survive things, not to go through the zombie apocalypse, not to go through all of the things that are coming, but there is a plan from the Almighty God to see you rescued. And we, we've discussed three things so far. We've discussed the keys of the kingdom or the keys to the kingdom that Jesus entrusted to this congregation. We also talked about the rapture of rescue. And then last week we talked about the crown of the faithful, which is the reward for those overcomers who actually complete the race. That's a very important distinction. Not everyone who runs the race ends the race. There are no participation trophies in the kingdom of God. doesn't really align with our current way of thinking, but it is very much God's current way of thinking. He wants us to be faithful. He wants us to endure. He wants us to overcome. So today we're, we're kind of looking at the last two verses in, in this letter, verse 12 and verse 13. And, and I want to talk about, if you need a title today, it's simply this, the legacy of overcomers. Everybody say the legacy of no, say it like you're going to preach with me. Say legacy. Legacy. 
On the count of 72. I'm just kidding. Anyway, the legacy of overcomers. What is legacy? Legacy is not only what we leave behind, but legacy is also what has been entrusted to us by those who went before us. It's very easy in this day and age of of pseudo-humanitarianism to get caught up in what we do and paying it forward to the next generation, which that's definitely a part of legacy, but it's only half of the legacy. If you're only leaving something for those who came behind you, what are you leaving them and where did you get it? You receive legacy, therefore you are able to impart legacy. Does that make sense? And if if you're receiving things from this world and that's what you're leaving, your legacy, as the Bible tells us, is going to be like wood, hay, and stubble. It's going to burn up in the day of refining. But we need to receive a legacy from the Almighty God so that we can leave a legacy. And the legacy that we receive and the legacy that takes us into the eternal state or the eternal age is what we're unpacking today. I want to talk about two different legacies of the overcomers. The first one is the legacy of eternal authority. Everybody say authority. Authority. Everybody say eternal. eternal. This is authority that begins in the day and age in which we live now, but continues into the next age and will never end. This is not for everyone. It is for everyone, but not everyone receives it. It is for every believer, but not every believer walks into this because not every believer is faithful and enduring. Revelation chapter 3, the beginning of verse 12, this is what Jesus says. He says, to he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar. Everybody say pillar. Pillar. Now I know we're southern, but that's not talking about what you put your head on when you go to bed. Pillar. That ain't what that is. I'm going to make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And notice this, and he shall go out no more. Now, already some of y'all have thrown up a wall because you think that God is chauvinistic. No, that's just the ancient way of writing. The he here is genderless. It's not only speaking of men. It's speaking in a genderless term, speaking of male or female, believers who overcome. And this is the first aspect of legacy that we begin to see here. And I put the the Greek words in here so you can understand. I'm not going to spend a boatload of time unpacking that because like last I checked, none of us speak ancient Greek, right? Kim, you speak any ancient Greek? Me neither. Chris, good to see you. How's Tennessee doing? We miss you. We love you. We're praying for you. Next chapter is going to be awesome in Jesus' name. Amen? Good to see you. Are you a volunteer? Is that what it is? Buccaneers? That private, very cool, but you're up there near the the volunteers and it's Tennessee. You got rolling hills, no more flat rolling junk hills. But anyway, glad that you're here. We we love you. We're definitely praying for you. Good to see you. But do you speak any ancient Greek while we're on the subject? No, no, no Greek either. I'm fairly certain that they speak something up in Tennessee that wasn't ancient Greek either. They speak banjo up there, I think. Anyway. So we we put the Greek words in here. If you don't mind, Eden, put that scripture back up on the screen. Revelation 3, verse 12. I'm going to make him a pillar. I'm going to make the the believer who overcomes a pillar. This is the Greek word stulos. Everybody say stulos. stulos. Man, you sound so amazing. Welcome, class, to ancient Greek 101, stulos. I'm going to make him a stulos. What is a stulos? A stulos is a pillar, a column, a support beam, or in a metaphorical sense, it's like a flame rising into the heavenlies like a pillar. We can see that in the Old Testament, like a reference there. Jesus, or the Spirit of God, moved in front of the people like a pillar of fire. This is the word that's being used here, and this is a very interesting word in the, in the Hebrew, the word that connects here is the word that some of y'all may be familiar with, which is the word kabod, which is the weight of the glory of God or the weight of the identity of God. Not just it, he's heavy. No, it's just like when you begin to understand who God is, that, that weight just begins to weigh on you. Like, I can't even live different now that I know who God is. And that's what we're talking about here. And what you have to understand is there is a weight that begins to rest on the shoulders of the people who identify themselves by the name of Christ. 
When you begin to say, I belong to Jesus Christ, when you begin to say, I may not understand everything, I may not know what tomorrow holds, but he is my God, he is my strength, he is my forever help in a time of trouble. When you begin to live like this, there is a weight that begins to rest on you. And sometimes this weight feels crushing. Somebody know what I'm talking about. It's not a bad weight, but it's extremely heavy because it is the weight of the glory of the almighty God. And not, not many of y'all are, are like into structural engineering and anything. Morgan definitely is into this and she can back me up on this. But, but a pillar or a column is not just designed to look pretty. We can decorate them to kind of hide them, to make them like feel like they're part of the decor, but they're actually a vital part of the structure. And here's what happens. The weight of the building, especially the roof, settles onto a pillar you got to hear this. The weight settles onto the pillar, and the pillar distributes the weight across the entire footprint. Did you catch that? The job of the overcomer, the responsibility of the overcomer is to receive the weight and by the strength of the weight himself to distribute the weight around the world. We're not supposed to say, I just got to get my Jesus on. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't get involved because it's been a really, really rough couple of weeks and I just need to go soak in the presence of God. No, that's not how it works, believer. That may be what happens in society, but when you are filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when you are in touch with the God of all gods and you know him by name, he begins to rest a weight on you and that weight is something you begin to distribute and in the middle of your unrest, in the middle of the time where you should have no peace, there is a peace that goes beyond all understanding and it begins to rest on you and begins to emanate out of you. He says, I'm going to make you a pillar in the temple of my God. What, what is he talking about here? What, what is, how are you going to make me a pillar in the temple of the Almighty God? Because the temple got destroyed like a bunch of years ago. Jesus predicted this and then just a few years later the temple was destroyed there is no temple right now what what's he talking about he's not talking about a temple in israel he's not talking about a temple in, in the natural world he's talking about a temple that has been eternally established in the realm of god before creation ever took place this is the same temple that we can see later on in the book of revelation that is firmly ensconced in the middle of the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of the realm of God like a bride adorned for her husband. This is a vital aspect of the eternal state and the kingdom that Jesus is coming to, to actually establish in the world in a physical sense. And I just lost some of you because you're like, no, it's all about how I feel right now. No, he's got a plan of something that's coming. He's going to catch the bride out of here. He's going to deal with Israel once and for all. He's going to deal with religion once and for all. And when that's over, he is going to establish a kingdom in this earth and a new earth that he creates out of a place of fire. That's what the Bible tells us. And this, this word that is used here for temple is not just speaking of a general temple. It is a word that is literally speaking of the tabernacle itself. What is the tabernacle? Those of you that went through our tabernacle study in the month of January, when we're actually going to pick that up in May, go into part two. The tabernacle was not the whole structure. There was a sanctuary, and right in the middle of the sanctuary was the tabernacle. What made the tabernacle different? The tabernacle was where the presence of Almighty God rested. He says, I'm going to make you, if you are an overcomer, somebody hear me, you're struggling right now. You don't understand. I want to give up. I want to walk away. But if you can endure, if you can endure the pain of the cross, despising the shame, knowing that there is a prize to a higher calling that's coming just down the pike, if you can hang on, God wants to take you and make you an integral part of the structure of the eternal temple that he is establishing. Well, I just, I just want to have my name on a pew. This is way better than names on pews. Pastor, if I could just, if I could have a reserved parking place. No, way better than that. Why? why? Because, because it's important. Hey, if you don't mind, put the scripture back up there. He is making you a distributing column in the structure of what he is going to use in the eternal state. But he's speaking specifically 
of the inner court within the tabernacle. The inner court, it, for those of you that remember, this is the holy place or the holy of holies. And we can see this described in Exodus chapter 25 to chapter 30 and then also in Revelation chapter 1 verse 10. And if I get going too fast, somebody raise your hand and I'll slow down not. But anyway, let, let me know you're with me today, okay? Because i got to lay some foundation so you know where we're going. Y'all learning something this morning? Okay, cool. Let's continue on. And he says, I'm, to he who overcomes, I'm going to make, them, uh, make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Eden, can you put that scripture back on the screen for him? I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. In the temple of my God. Now, right here, confusion begins to settle in. Who's talking, who's he talking to, and what's he talking about? This is why it's really, really important for me to put these hieroglyphics up here that don't look like words that we say. Because you see, we read the Bible through our Western lens of North American English understanding. Of English that's been transliterated a bunch of different times from the original Greek or the original Hebrew. And meanings begin to shift. He says, I want to make you a structural piece that is integral in the temple of my God. The, the phrase right here of my God is mutheos. That, that's the Greek phrase. And this does not mean of the God who is mine. It's not a possessive phrase. That's how we would read it. My God. That, of my God, right? That's possessive. But in the original Greek, that's not what it's saying. It's not possessive. In the original Greek, this phrase mutheos means of me, myself, who is God. You got to hang on to that because religion wants to tell you it means something else so that you lose authority and lose power because there's only power and authority in the name of the one. Amen? So what we begin to understand is God has a plan for you, struggling believer who's going through hell, going through trials, going through persecution, going through all the stuff that is in your life. If you will overcome, he wants to make you structural in the temple that is eternal of the temple that he himself builds. And I'm going to make you a vital part of everything that I'm doing in the eternal state. And this is really, really important because, y'all, this is divine placement. This is not something that your pastor can do for you. This is not something that your celebrity TikToker can do for you. This is not something that your favorite celebrity worship leader or favorite celebrity preacher can do for you. In fact, this is nothing that your denomination or your theological bent can do for you. The only one who can place you in this spot is the only one who is creating this temple because he is the one who created you in his own image and in in his own likeness, he has the authority, so therefore he is able to take you out of darkness into marvelous light and place you in a place of structural integrity in the middle of his eternal plan. And he says, I don't want you to just go through life 70 plus years if you're lucky and just say that's all there is I've got something in mind for you Caleb that goes so much further than anything you can ever even ask or even think I've got an eternal plan that has been in my mind before I ever started anything and I am calling you to a place of overcoming patient endurance where you get filled with me and you allow my strength to live in you and through you through every piece of hell and bull crap that you live with God doesn't say that last word but Sometimes I do say it. The reason that we need to understand this is God is greater than our circumstance. And the plan of God is greater than our circumstance. But you see, all that we see is what we're living in right now. And we get on to, in, into the culture of the world, which does nothing but feed the drama in our life and say, this is reality. Hey, baby, that's not reality. Reality is determined by the one who spoke reality into existence. The one his, who is truth himself. And he says, I've got an eternal plan for you. I don't know about y'all, but I'm excited that this is not all there is. I don't know what I look like in the eternal state, but I hope I don't look like this. This is my hope. I will finally get back down to my fighting weight, and it's going to be awesome. Maybe. I don't know. There's angel food cake there. Surely. Maybe that won't happen. I don't know. I don't know what it looks like. And anyone who tells you they do, they're making it up. That's, it's not in the Bible. But what I do know is if I can be patient 
And if I can endure, and if you can be patient, and if you can endure, and you and I can be faithful believers who trust and rely and obey on the one who is truth. He says, I will take you out of this hell and I will make you an eternal piece of my structure. That cool to y'all? Or am I just bobbled around out here? All right, cool. Let's dive into this a little bit more. Jesus is giving a conditional eternal promise to overcomers. Religion will tell you that this is an unconditional promise, but that's not the case. It is a conditional promise. It is only given to those who overcome. We went into a lot of that over the last couple of weeks. I don't want to spend a lot of time there, but you have to understand that. Last week, we, we, we got called to a place of, do you have blessed assurance? Do you know if you're one of the five wise or one of the five foolish? Do you know? It, 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 good phrase that we hear a lot in denominationalism. If you died right now, where would you go? Do you know the answer to that? Do you assume? How does your lifestyle match with what you see in the word of God? It's a question that we should all ask. The the conditional promise is to the ones who overcome. If, if you and I don't overcome, we don't step into the eternal state in the exact same place. But this is God's plan for every one of us. Here's what he says. If you overcome. Y'all remember there's a lot of if-then statements in the Bible. If you overcome, then I will make you a pillar. And if I make you a pillar, then if I make you a pillar, then this is an eternal designation. That's what that last phrase is. He shall go out no more. That's eternal. You're not going anywhere. You see, right now, life happens. You see, right now, confusion settles in. And so many of us begin to live our life the way that the prodigal son did in the parable that Jesus told. I want my inheritance now. 867 Christ. Now, I want my inheritance now. Give it to me now. That was a dumb joke. Y'all should laugh at that. That's like the fifth time I've told it. At some point, I'm going to make you laugh or give up and try another one. But I want my inheritance now. It's time for me to get my inheritance now. And I get what I think I want. I get my cookies for the day. I get my feel goods. I get my affirmation statements. I get my connection touch. And then I go do what I want to do. Somebody know what I'm talking about. And then we find ourselves, as as it says in the King James, living riotously. Like, that ain't how none of us talk. Not living right. Doing things he wasn't supposed to be doing. Doing things he knew was wrong, but doing it on purpose. Because I'm big enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me, and I can do whatever I want. That's how the prodigal son was living. Until his money ran out. Until all his friends abandoned him, until he found himself working in a pig pen, doing something that as a Hebrew child should have never even been touching, messing with things that were an abomination from God himself. Oh, isn't that interesting how when we grab our inheritance early and do what we feel like we're old enough and big enough to do, we end up touching things we have no business touching. Next thing you know, it pulls us into the slop with it. And he comes to his senses in the middle of eating food prepared for hogs. I don't know if you know anything about hogs. Kim, I'm coming back. Do you know anything about the hogs? Bacon, yeah. We, we know all about bacon, right? <laughs> Pastor Matt, you actually may know. Do you know anything about hogs? He knows a little bit about hogs. You don't feed hogs like hog feed. You don't go to like True Value and pick up a bag of hog feed. Here's what you do, like you go to that trash bag that you hung on the drawer in your kitchen. Y'all don't do that? That's only us? Yeah, on on a given day when we're cooking for the army that lives in our house, we may have two garbage bags and they're not like the small ones, they're like the big like garden bags, the big huge giant. You could put like, never mind. You fill those up, you take that out to where the hogs are and you go, and all the paper and all the junk and all the trash, that's what hogs eat. When we find ourselves grabbing our inheritance early, not trusting the Father to take us where the Father is going to take us, we find ourselves consuming things that are not even edible. But when he came to his senses, he came back. Here's the deal, y'all. You've got to understand this, believer. If he had never come to his senses, he would have died in the pig pen. 
But religion says, no, he was still a son. He's going to be okay. He's a dead son in the middle of a pig pen. And I don't know if you know anything about hogs. You leave something dead in the middle of a hog pen very long. It won't be there very long because it will be consumed by the hogs who eat the trash and eat anything else. You'll be consumed by the thing that you celebrated and you chose. And pastor, that's heavy. No, that's truth. We need to hear this because we don't need to get caught up in the lies. If I make you a pillar, it's an eternal designation. And if I put you there, no one can take you out of there. But I'm not putting you there yet. You have to endure to get there. You need to understand this. He wants to make you a pillar, but you're not a pillar right now. Because the temple is not here yet. We're in the church age. This is the age of endurance. This is the age of faithfulness. That's the legacy of eternal authority that he wants to entrust to us. But there's another legacy that I believe that, I, that we can see here at the end of verse 12, and it's the legacy of eternal identity. Let's look at the end of verse 12. This is what Jesus says as he continues. And I will write on him, again, this is genderless, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. Okay, that, that's a lot of repeating statements there. So let's break this down. Okay, if you're in doer, I'm going to make you a pillar in the temple. By the way, it's the temple of me, myself, who is God. Okay? And then, if you're in doer, if you endure and I make you a pillar, I'm going to walk up to the pillar and I'm going to write on the pillar. What am I going to write on the pillar? I'm going to write the name of me, myself, who is God. And then I'm also going to write the name of the city of me, myself, who is God. Y'all tracking with me? And that's the new Jerusalem that I've already told you about that I saw coming down out of heaven like a bride adorned for her husband. That's what the Bible says. This new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from me, myself, who is God. So if you endure, I'm going to entrust identity to you that is extremely important. We live in, a, in an age right here, and y'all calm down. I'm not going to get political. Relax. But I do have to bump culture every now and then. I, I, know, I know denominational and postmodern Christianity says don't ever bump culture because people get offended. I open the Bible, I get offended like on the daily. Last I checked, I'm not holy, and he's very holy. So I'm going to invite y'all to be offended with me. There is a notion in, in current society chasing identity. The reason is because we don't know who our source is. When you're taught your entire life that your existence is accidental, it was the result of a collision in the cosmos or that you accidentally crawled out of the primordial ooze and accidentally spouted legs and accidentally stopped being a monkey and started being a human. When you're told this your entire existence, it's no wonder that you struggle trying to find identity. You're just trying to keep the, the theory, the false theory of evolution alive. You had not seen anything evolve in millions and millions of years, so we're just trying to keep it alive. I'm trying to help evolution. God, I'm trying to help you here. Let me, let me change the way I identify. And here's the deal. It's not just in the current thing. Self-identification has been something that's been going on with as long as humanity's been here. We identify ourselves by our weaknesses. I struggle with this, therefore that's what I am. I like this, therefore that's what I am. By that definition, you would be hearing a sermon today from a Cheeto. I like them. When today is over, I got a secret stash up in my office, and guess what I'm going to eat for lunch? Pre-lunch, I'm going to eat me a Cheeto. I'm not telling you it's okay. I'm not telling you it's nutritious. It's not. It's bad for me, but guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to eat it anyway. But that don't make me a dang Cheeto. Because we don't understand source, so we don't understand identity. Pastor, that's hate speech. No, that's not. Don't lean into the culture. Resist culture. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you'll know what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of the Almighty. You need to know what the Word of God says, which means you got to turn off the noises and turn up the Word of God in your life. I like how Olga said that earlier. Get your daily bread. If we get mercy muffins every morning, we get the daily bread, I'm like, this is a perfect, that's, that's the breakfast of champions. Bread with a side of bread. And then for lunch, I have me a bread salad and then a pizza for dinner. 
Sometimes I dip my carbs in other carbs. But anyway. Y'all don't have carb sauce? Uh, you t- totally. You can make a gravy out of bread. Never mind. That's, that's gross. But anyway. So God is talking about identity because identity is vital. If you don't know who you are, you will not understand your future. And if you don't know where you come from, if you don't know your source, you cannot even understand your present, much less your future. But when you understand who is the one who designed you according to his pattern, according to his will, according to his purpose, your identity begins to matter. And here's what he's saying to you. Hey, if you will hang on and you will endure, I've got an eternal identity for you. And this eternal identity has layers. Look at your neighbor and bump and say, layers. Like get it down in your throat and say, layers. He says, I'm going to write on them the name of my God. The word grafo means to express in writing on behalf of another, but it also means to designate by written authority. I'm going to mark you, and I'm going to designate you. I'm, in other words, I'm going to distinguish you from everything else that I created. I just want to fit into this group. He's like, come out from among them and be ye separate. You're a peculiar people. You're not supposed to fit in like everybody else. I'm going to make you different. I'm going to mark you and I'm going to distinguish you with what? The onama motheos, the identity of me, myself, who is God. I'm not just going to identify you by anything. I'm not going to identify you by your actions. I'm not going to identify you by your lust. I'm not going to identify you by the color of your skin. I'm not going to identify you by the person that you like to sleep with. I'm not going to identify you by any of that. I'm going to identify you by myself because I created you in my image and in my likeness. And you, when you overcome by the power of my strength, you take on the weight of my identity. And when you take on the weight of my identity, that's when you're identified by truth. I'm going to mark you and I'm going to distinguish you by the name. Why is the name of Jesus so important? Because there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. The name is where the authority is. If you're not praying in the name, you have no authority. If you're not praying in the name, you have no power. But when you use the name, the name begins to permeate into who you are, washing away your lust, washing away your opinion, washing away your weaknesses, washing away your desires, and you're no longer longer identified by sin you're identified by the one who created you praise God man y'all making the Pentecost come out in me today I want to mark you and I want to distinguish you I want you to be different we want to be like all the other nations God give us a king no I don't want to give you a king please God I looked at their social media It's not fair. Stop looking at their social media. But that's not fair. They got to look at mine. They're not looking at yours. They're too busy posting more highlight reels. They don't care what you're doing. You just care what they're doing. God, please change my identity, but not too much. God, please change me. But not today. God, would you please just wreck me gently? (laughs) Dear Heavenly Father, let the fire of the Holy Ghost refine me a little bit on the outer parts. Like that's how we pray. That's how we live. We don't truly believe. We act like it. It sounds good. It makes for a really good soaking session on our yoga mat in the back corner of the church on prayer meeting. Um, Jesus. Meanwhile, we're missing the power of everything that is his name. Meanwhile, we're missing the authority that is in his name. We would rather be marked by everything else. But he's like, no, no, no. If you endure, yeah, it's tough. It's a struggle. But if you endure and if you're faithful, I'm going to distinguish you 
not by your struggle, but by who I am. But he doesn't stop there. He also says the name of the city of my God. And y'all, this, this is really, 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 really important. Why does the city of me, myself, who is God matter? Just like if you don't know your source, it's easy to get confused about who you are. If you don't know where you're going, it's easy to settle here and now. Thinking that the here and now is all that there is. I got to be a better employee. I got to be a better student. I got to be a better spouse. I got to be a better friend. I got to be a better neighbor. I got to be a better driver. Oh God, don't make me do that. I got to be a better whatever. You have to understand this. This place that consumes so much of our current reality is going to be consumed with an all-consuming fire. Be a good steward of what you've been entrusted. Be a good human, in other words. But don't think this is the end. If you endure, there's an eternal city of responsibility waiting on you. The city is the city that I have named and it is the city that I have designed for you. This city is the reward for the faithful. This city is the reward for those who endure and overcome. This city is named by God himself, for God himself, for the bride of God himself. And he says, look, if you will endure, I'm not only going to distinguish you by my identity, I'm going to mark you by your eternal destination. Somebody hear me. I don't know what comes next. He does. I don't know what tomorrow holds. He does, because he holds tomorrow. He's already there. He's already working through it. And if he opened the door, he's, he, he's not letting anybody shut it. If he opened the door, he's going to walk back into the big middle of it. If he's closing the door, he's going to let it be closed because he's got a plan that goes beyond anything you can even imagine. He's not finished with you yet. So hang on. But your hope and your future is not in this life. It's in the city of the one who is God. And he is the one who names this city. You're identified by... The identity of the source, but you're also identified by your eternal citizenship. He says, when you become a believer, you're no longer citizens of this world. Book of Hebrews says that we're citizens of a higher country. But yet we think this is all there is. Look at the end of verse 12. He says, and then I will write on them. My new name. Everybody say, my new name. name. And this is where a lot of people get confused. Religion gets really confused. When I was growing up at my dad's church in Baton Rouge, we used to sing an old-timey song. I think it was out of page 163 in the Brown hymn book. Anybody know about them brown and white hymn books? Like, Ashley, you know about them brown and white. Singing to the Lord a new song. Praise the Lord, everyone. Turn in your books, your song books to page 163. Every song started like that. And we would sing that song, oh, there's a new name written down in glory and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. The problem with that song is it's not biblical, but that doesn't matter because I'm Christian. We can do it how I want to. I don't think that last part was in there, but That's how we used to do it when I was growing up. Some of you are like, oh my God, this dude's a freak. Yeah, you're right. So religion will tell you, oh, you're getting a new name. You know, you got a new name when you got baptized. When you came out of the water, you got the name of the one who you were baptized into. He is now your eternal heavenly father. That's when you got your new name. You don't get your new name when you get your reward when you're called away. He says it's his new name. Well, Cool. What does that mean? The word is kyanos or kyanos, if you really want to be accurate. And it doesn't mean brand new. It means unprecedented, uncommon, never before comprehended. It's not like, hey, my name's Jesus, but tomorrow is going to be only I know. That's not what he's saying. 
He's saying, you know my name, but my name is not common. My authority is unprecedented. In fact, my identity is beyond comprehension. But I'm going to mark you and designate you by my uncommon identity. I'm going to mark you in a way that no one can ever say that you're not mine. Because I'm going to mark you by who I am. You have to understand this, church. Your source is an uncommon source. Your source has uncommon authority. Your source has uncommon identity. And your source wants to make you an integral part of his eternal structure. And this city that is a reward that's coming down out of the realm of God is a city that has been named by the Almighty specifically for his bride to have a seat of authority. Like, Pastor, I'm not sure I believe that. You've got to go to Revelation chapter 4 and see the bride in seats of authority surrounding the throne of the only one who sits on the eternal throne. But the beautiful thing is, when we come into the presence of God, John sees the bride coming down off of our seats of authority and taking our crowns, which is our eternal reward, and laying them at the feet of the only one who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. How can you do this? Only if you endure. Only if you are faithful. So we talked about the legacy of eternal authority. We talked about the legacy of eternal identity. Let me close with this, the eternal legacy of the overcomers. Verse 13, this is what he says. Chapter 3, verse 13. This is how he, he literally closes out every one of these seven letters. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Notice churches. Now, I'm not like Ashley and I, I teach English. I don't. I struggle with English. But last I checked, when you put an S at the end of a word, it means there are more than one, right? Most of the time, right? Come on, don't jack with me. Y'all mess with math already. Now you're messing with English? God, just leave it alone. When you make something plural, it's not talking about just one. Why well, I need to know that. It's very, very important. Like he says this in every one of the letters. But it's extremely important that we recognize it in the letter to the church of Philadelphia. Because again, this is the only one of the seven churches where he talks about the eternal promise. And it would be very, very easy to say, well, I don't live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, or Philadelphia in ancient Turkey. I, I don't live there. That doesn't apply to me. What is church? Remember, he said in Matthew chapter 16, it's the ecclesia, it's his community. Common thing, common purpose, common mission. The word that we see here, ek, lasia. Ek means called out. So when you look at ecclesia, what it literally means, if you do a literal definition, his community are the ones who he has called out. Who's been called? Everyone's been called. He said, many are called, few are chosen. What does chosen mean? These are the ones who responded to the call. You've received the call. If you have responded to the call and you've surrendered your crown, you've surrendered your identity for his identity, if you've surrendered your power for his power, if you've surrendered your sinfulness for his holiness, you are a part of his bride. If you've received Jesus into your heart through the baptism of repentance and through the baptism of water and through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you've been through all of this, any aspect of that, let me just tell you this. Right now, somebody needs to hear me. That is your designation. And it's important for you to hear that Jesus is not just talking to an ancient church that had been through living hell. He's talking to everyone and every time he has ever called whoever responded. His promise is for you. You may be in struggle right now, but the promise of the Almighty is for you. If you've got ears, you need to hear what the breath of the Almighty God is saying to those He has called out. 
I'm calling you out. I don't want you to stay there because I have a designation for you and I'm going to mark you with my name and I'm going to mark you with your eternal destination and I'm going to mark you with my uncommon identity. And when I mark you, no one can snatch you out of my hand. But you got to endure to get that marking. you got to endure to get that designation. So I want you to hear this. We've already talked about this in the church of Philadelphia. Here it is in closing. He gave us a promise of rescue. Everybody say rescue. He's not going to leave us here. He promised to rescue us if we overcome. He promised a legacy of authority if we're faithful in this life then he promises us a legacy of identity if we surrender to him. So let me ask you some questions here. Just in, as we, in fact, this would be a really good time. Everybody close your eyes. Nobody moving around. I'm going to let you go here in just a second, but nobody moving right now. We're going to go back into worship here so that we can respond to the word of God. But I want to ask you some questions here at the close of this sermon. Are you ready for rescue? Are you really ready? Do you know? Do you know the answer to that question? I'm not sure. How do I know? Are you living a faithful life? The last question truly answers that question, are you ready for us? Is Jesus Christ your source and your identity? Are you leaning on yourself? Are you leaning on your own understanding? Are you leaning on everything in society? Or are you truly trusting the one who designed you? Who says, I don't want to just be with you. I want to be in you. I believe there's somebody here this morning who's been struggling That's not me being prophetic. That's me being a person that just knows how to look around the room. If you're here today and you've been struggling, I want you to know Jesus Christ is the answer. You may not have been faithful up to this point, but he wants to impart strength to be faithful through his spirit. Do I have to sign a card? Do I have to go to a class? Do I have to come down to the front and people put their hands on me and knock me to the concrete? No, you don't have to do any of that. You see, this designation is a place between you and God. No one else even has to be a part of that. This is a moment between you and the giver of life where he says, I want to change you from the inside out, but you got to trust me. Simply starts by just saying, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I can't save myself. No matter how much I try, I can't save myself. No matter how awesome I am, no matter what my heritage has been, it's not enough on my own. That's why I need you. Maybe you're here this morning. Maybe you're watching online and you feel like God is finished with you. I just want you to know He is not finished. He's not finished. His work is not done. He's still calling you. He's still leading you to a place where you can respond to Him. Why don't we just take about 30 seconds and just invite the presence of God to invade this moment. Father, I pray that you would walk up and down every row, walk up and down every aisle, Lord, I pray that you would begin to touch every heart, begin to touch every life by the power of your spirit, Lord. Lord, I pray right now that you would begin to move in a very powerful way. I I, I pray, God, that you would begin to move into people's hearts who've been bound by religious misunderstanding and who've been trapped in past experiences and, 
even trapped in false identities by society, maybe even by doctors, or maybe even by something that's happened to them, or maybe even what they've done to somebody else. God, I pray that you would begin to reach into the hearts and the minds and the lives of everyone under the sound of my voice. God, maybe there's a husband who is trying to find peace by looking in other places for comfort. Lord, maybe there's a wife who is struggling because she's hurting, Lord. And she's just wanting someone to show her the love that can only truly come from you. Maybe there's a young adult, God, who has been trying to find their place in this world and they're choosing you, but everything around them in society is telling them to walk away from you. God, maybe there's, a, maybe there's an individual here today who has lived for you faithfully, but they're going through hell right now and they just feel so abandoned. God, I pray right now that you would just begin to move in this place. Nothing I say can do anything, Lord, but your word is forever settled. And you're not finished because you're still working, Lord. Maybe there's a child here whose parents aren't believers and that they've been struggling because they don't know how to stand up for you in the midst of a home that's divided. God, I pray that you would breathe divine strength into this individual, Lord. Let them know that if you call them to this place, that you're not going to abandon them in this place, that you've got something else for them beyond this moment, and you want to give them the strength to endure. 